So hi, Rob and Chris. It's great to meet you both. Thank you. And I was going to say congratulations on completing Earth, but I suppose that sounds a bit odd. Congratulations on finishing the series. You've probably still got some of the planet left to explore. It sounded like a mammoth project. And Rob, I was really interested to know when you're approaching trying to squash 4.0 billion years of Earth's history into five episodes. I mean, where do you even begin? Yeah, well, no, it, that, that was indeed the first challenge that 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 was my existential crisis two and a bit years ago, and it's sort of taken two and a bit years to two and a half years to to make that happen. I think very early on, we made the decision, you know, um, working with Chris, that this was going to be the story of life and geology, and really shaping it around those two two characters, if you like, all the way through that, and and that rather than try and tell everything and or, 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 you know, try and be too exhaustive about trying to join all the dots that we would feel we wanted to be liberated to feel free to jump, it'd take big jumps with the story, to really zone in on those bits of the story where those two elements really interact with each other, life and the planet, and how those elements are really the formative moments of, of creating the, the modern world that, that we have today. Um, and so, so, you know, as Chris has been saying, earlier we looked really hard for what some of the latest best science is and 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 where we could you know zone in on those those moments really it's been great to see how that unfolds over the series and i think as viewers watch they'll discover that in the last 4.5 billion years it's been a bit of a rough deal for uh for some of its uh lowest parts chris i was wondering if you could tell me about some of the most extreme events that people can expect to see well, I mean, there were a multitude. The Earth's had a bit of a roller coaster, actually, um, <clears throat> but always in a sort of creative, dynamic way, which is which is great. Um, so, what we say: firstly, no atmosphere. Um, that was pretty tricky. Uh, space came all the way down to we we're not going to be able to protect any life as we know it here. So that was the first thing to overcome. So, one of our programs deals with atmosphere, not just its initial formation, but how it's been radically changed uh, by planetary forces, but also by life itself. So, you know, you have life interacting with that atmosphere, obviously the fundamentals of oxygen and CO2, uh, methane, so on and so forth. Um, so that's an integral part of our story. Um, but then there have been other parts, uh, uh, you know, times in the Earth's history where things have got very hot or very cold. One of our programs is called Snowball. Virtually the whole of the planet froze, maybe all of it froze. Um, and life got through that. Life had, was already here at that point, complex life. So it, it survived that. And at other points, it got very, very hot. You know, even after in the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, we've had periods of extreme heat. Um, thankfully, it's cooled down, and we now have life as we know it at, at this point in time. Um, but I think the key thing is that all of those conditions may sound very hostile to us, would have been hostile had we been around, but, you know, for life, it's had that tenacity to get through it. So, yes, we've lost diversity of species in some of the extinctions, our first program is about the Permian extinction, essentially. Um, we lose 90% of species on, on the planet at that point. Um, but throughout all of these trials and tribulations, all of these ups and downs that, uh, that the geology has thrown at the planet and then life has thrown back at the geology, um, that life has survived. And that makes it a very, very special place. And, there's, and, and we are here conscious of that. So that makes us a very special species at a special time too. Yeah, and I guess it figures that the conditions would sound pretty alien because at one point Earth was just a planet in space like any other one, so it wouldn't have looked. No, well, thankfully we had a fantastic visual effects budget. I mean, and obviously we've gone to locations whereby there is a parallel to some of the things that we've uh, we've been talking about. And when it comes to volcanism, if you stand on top of a volcanic crater that's active now, um, that's going to look pretty similar to those that were active previously. But there are not too many of those, so. Rob and the team worked, uh, you know, on, with a, a VFX company to produce some astonishing visuals, which will give people an insight as to what it was like. And as I understand it, the events in this series they don't roll out in a chronological order. So, could you tell me more about how you positioned the one or two? Yeah, I think there. Uh, we I, I like to think of this like as a biography, where we're really sort of trying to build a picture of key moments in the planet's life, the planet's history that actually tell you something about today. And so, so you know, some biographies you tell from birth to, to death, but but some, you know, you try and, you, you know, it's actually more insightful to jump around um, 
uh, on that front. And I think, I think you know, with this series, one of the things that I think we're quite keen to get across is that there is contemporary re- relevance in every episode. And the, the first episode we start with, um, Inferno, is of this extraordinary climate warming moment, uh, a period of time that the 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 Earth was utterly transformed, and and the parallels with what's happening today, I think, help really, you know. Um, land why the why it matters to look back into the, the planet's history um but 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 as i say keen to really take these big jumps to to help give us insight into just you know just how varied this world is we think of it as a very permanent and unchanging place we think of it but but we've been here for sort of two three hundred thousand years as homo sapiens we've been farming for only eleven thousand years um everything we, we we've come to be in a point where where we've evolved into a very particular climate in fact for most of earth's history there's been no ice on it for almost you know it's only it's quite unusual in earth's history for there to be ice but that's the world that we've evolved to come into and i think we start with inferno we immediately go to the other extreme that shows just how far the earth can travel with snowball and and so the series is trying to sort of you know take people along in in that regard yeah, and that contemporary relevance really comes across in Inferno, which we just watched. Um, and in that episode, uh, Chris, you said that uh, Earth is more indifferent to us than we care to admit. And I really like that point, because often when we talk about the future of the planet, I think uh, people assume that we're talking about all life, when often the case is that the planet will go on, whether we're here or not. So I was just wondering if you could expand on that point. Well, no, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, life will survive. And what we show in our series is that it's come up against some really stiff opposition, fundamental physical opposition, um, extreme cold, extreme heat, lack of oxygen, uh, you know, lack of CO2. Um, it, it's, but it's, it's tenacity has overcome that. Um, nothing wants to die out. Nothing wants to be extinct. And the thing is, whatever we do to this planet now in a very rapid space of time, even if it were to mirror some of the cataclysmic events that we report on in Earth's earlier history, um, life will go on. We, we, we could do our very, very worst here. But when we do talk about saving the planet, we're not talking about saving the planet, we're talking about saving us as a species. The planet doesn't need saving. The planet's had some tougher times than we're giving it at the moment, and, and it's come through and it will do for some time. So I find that quite heartening. I mean, I, I like life probably more than I like any single species life, including human life. And I, I have an enormous admiration for, for that tenacity to survive, drive to survive. So, yes, we don't want to mess it up. It would be on our conscience. And as I say at the end of uh, this first program, you know, what's driven mass extinction events in the past have been planetary forces um, or life forces, not a single species that knows what it's doing. For. So for us to do that, doesn't sit easy with 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 my conscience at all it's not something that we should be playing a part in absolutely um and i think uh you know it explores how bad conditions have gotten and that life has still bounced back even when it seems to go back to square one um rob i was wondering if in your research you came across anything that says if there's a kind of theoretical tipping point beyond which even the species that do well with things like global warming, even they wouldn't survive. And could we end up with a dead planet? Well, I mean, I think as Chris is saying, I think that the evidence is the opposite of that, 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 that there's always some kind of life that will find a way through. And, and we, you know, in Snowball, we explore a period where on and off, but effectively life, the planet was locked in ice for 50 million years and life survived that. In Inferno, we see temperature rises much, much higher, and 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 extraordinary levels of extinction. Ninety percent, ninety six percent in the oceans, and life survives. So I th- I don't think that that's the 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 direction of travel. What what is particularly salutary, and just picking up on what Chris was saying, is that it, it it's the time periods that that this these changes happen. Both in the past, they've been slower rises compared to what we're doing today but also just got to think about it it took 10 million years after the permian mass extinction that we just saw in inferno for a range of biodiversity to return to the planet that was there before 10 million years for sapiens humans have been around for 200,000 years and so these timescales are really hard to get your head around but when you look at it in the, the modern context I think thinking about 
are, are the changes that are happening to the planet today in a kind of geological time gives a picture of uh, how we should really you know draw on understanding what the planet's done in the past it, it's not a, a life issue it's it's a it's the biodiversity of the planet that we've got today and the, the species on its day that 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 is the uh, issue yeah that's a, a really profound series i think it's going to cover some really serious points having said that i did really want to touch on chris a moment you mentioned earlier about one of the big moments of the series for you um involved getting pooped on I was wondering if you'd tell our viewers about the condor. Yes, well, I, I like birds, and um, condors are pretty special, uh, very ancient type of birds. They're sort of pretty much out of time, really, really. Um, and, and it's not, but it wasn't going to be pooped on. Pooping on is just, it's like getting sneezed on. It just means you've been close. That's what it comes down to. And, uh, yeah, the bird was flying down an escarpment in Chile, and I looked up, and as it was peering down at me, it opened its bowels. And a shower came out and a few specks hit my face and a few hit my jacket and trousers. And uh, they say it's lucky, but it was lucky for me because I just had a close encounter with one of the world's finest, most majestic birds. You know, didn't need any binoculars. It was so close. I was peering into his eye. Um, so, yeah, that sort of close contact with animals is, um, is something that I've always craved. And I don't worry about poo. I mean, I've spent my whole life covered in animal poo of one kind or another. And occasionally I wash my hands and I'm still here to talk about it. So... I don't get upset by those sorts of things. So I, I wear the condor's poo as a badge of uh, as a badge of honour. And you absolutely should. It's a privilege to get to experience it. Exactly. With you. So, um, on the series as well, I really like the way that it kind of flips certain preconceptions on its head. So uh, you talk a lot about how extinction is often seen as this exclusively bad thing, but actually it's essential. And there are mentions of certain species that are often kind of wrongfully maligned, like weeds and cockroaches and rats. Um, I was wondering if you think there are any other kind of species or processes that people might view differently when they finish watching the series. Well, we do, you see, I, I struggle with those preconceptions of what's nice and nasty in the animal kingdom. I mean, I'm a wasp fan. I love cockroaches. Cockroaches are one of the most singularly, you know, uh, uh, successful species the planet's ever thrown up. They've been around for more than 330 million years. And as Rob just said, we've only been here for 200,000. So they're already winning on paper. Uh, their adaptability, even in the contemporary uh, I I environment, means that uh, you know that we struggle to con control them. Um, so I have a an enormous admiration for anything like that that's successful. Another species that we feature um, is the rat, much maligned by many people. Of course, previous history doesn't help. It helps spread the uh, the plague around the world at certain times. Um, but I've enjoyed the company of rats. They're really bright and intelligent. I've kept them my myself. And and in the program, we use it to illustrate a highly successful generalist mammal, uh, the likes of which, you know, prospered when the dinosaurs, uh, you know, were blotted, finally blotted out by the asteroid impact. So, yeah, but I don't come with those, um, you know, I, I, I struggle with them completely. I, I think I, I'm aware of the fact that it takes all sorts to make the world go round. And we can't demonize species like that. We have to recognize they're all playing a functional role in an ecosystem. And if they're living near you, it's because they can and if they can, you ought to let them because it will mean that your environment is richer. And if it's richer, it's more stable and, and therefore it's more healthy. So I know that sounds like an oxymoron saying your environment's more healthy if you've got cockroaches in it. Many people are going to think that's completely the wrong way around. But in fact, biologically, that's, the, that's how it works. Absolutely. Um, and finally, Rob, what do you hope that people will take away from the series? Well, I just thought sort of a, a, a wow and a wonder, really, because are the Earth story which is our story, is an extraordinary roller coaster. But also there is something profound. I think one of the things that really surprised me when I came to the series and we got into this series is just how closed the system is. That we think of biology and we think of the interaction of species, you know, lots of what you see, you, you know, what Chris does in Spring Watch and things is, is, is about just the, you know, the delicate balance between species, but that, that interconnection goes between planet and and life as well. The, the 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 what happens with the rock shapes what happens with the biological matter, and the biology totally changes the rock. You know, and and that we are this one thing in in space, and I I found that very humbling and 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 extraordinary. Absolutely is. Well, thank you so much for your time, guys, and I can't wait for everyone to watch it. It's going to be incredible. Thank you. Thank you.